Most of us in this room will have been affected by someone living with a mental illness. The thing about mental illness is that it's invisible, it's hard to see. How can I go to work, talk with others, when all of this is going on in my head? The negativity makes it so incredibly difficult to think and function as a human being. This is what living with a mental illness is like. It's not news that one in four Australians currently experience a mental illness. And of those people, only about a third seek professional help. But we've got psychologists and counsellors everywhere, so why don't we just seek help? A big factor involves judgement. Well, you're so incredibly intimidated of letting your guards down, being vulnerable, sharing our true emotions with others. We think to ourselves, will others think I'm defected? Weak. What will they think about me? And so we end up bottling in this overwhelming anger, the sadness. We'll let it fester, infesting our minds, chewing away at our precious mental space. But now let's somehow pretend that we've overcome this judgment barrier. Well, we've decided on seeing a therapist. Dear therapist, how do you know what I've been through? Do you even know what living with a mental illness is really like? How do you know that? What will I do? How do I know what you've been through when you haven't done anything that I've been through? It's so incredibly difficult to relate to someone. So the biggest problem we have now is, why should I listen to you? How will you know what works and what doesn't in therapy when you haven't experienced all that I've been through? How will you know? Now this is where the idea of mental health lived experience and peer support comes in. It is such a rich, untapped resource pool whose full potential has not yet been realised. I'm 21 this year and a big advocate for mental health. I'm very passionate about the work I do and all of it stems from my personal lived experiences of anorexia and bulimia, which I've had for about eight years of my life. Growing up, some would have called me a bit of a perfectionist, although that is probably an understatement. Growing up, every single test I did in primary school, I had to get at least a 90. If not, I wasn't smart enough. Every single state and national track athletics competition I ever entered, I had to medal. If not, I wasn't fast, fit, or strong enough. So this notion of constantly having to one-up myself to avoid feeling like a failure, a waste of space, I had to translate it into how I thought I had to look. Living life was exhausting. It was this rigid rule book filled with bizarre, irrational rules, such as having to weigh every single thing I ate, have to eat at specific locations at specific times, not a single minute before or after. Everything was prescribed. And any deviation from these sets of rules will make me feel as if a million arrows were being shot through me. I started to restrict my food intake at around the age of 12. My parents noticed the weight loss and how I was angry and upset all the time. And they decided to contact the school psychologist. Now, upon seeing the school psychologist, I thought she was cold, unfriendly, unrelatable. This made me very reluctant to seek help throughout the rest of high school. Now, fortunately, towards the end of high school, after much pushing from a friend, I decided to give seeking help a proper second shot. Now, seeing this new therapist, we clicked. I was actually quite surprised. Recovery progressed. My mood lifted. But about a year later, I had a relapse and was admitted to hospital due to my low BMI and medical complications. And what followed on from that discharge was this never-ending cycle of psychologists, psychiatrists, dietitians, cardiologist appointments, inpatient, day-patient hospitalizations. 
I just couldn't do it. I, had, I was sick and tired of everything. I saw the value in all this intensive therapy I was doing. I knew I should keep going. I had all the professional support I needed right in front of me. Yet somehow, I started to disengage from my treatment team. I thought I had hit that point in recovery, where I had plateaued. I mean, I tried all the different therapies there ever was to try for the past eight years of my life. I lost hope, motivation. I felt I couldn't relate to my therapists on that personal, human-to-human -human basis. So I was surrounded by people who loved and cared for me, friends, family, professionals. And I felt so alone, like no one understood me. Now, a couple of years ago, I attended an eating disorder inspiration recovery night. And I'll be honest with you, going in, I was quite skeptical and apprehensive of just how inspirational this night would be. <coughs> I heard from a couple of speakers talk about their lived experiences with eating disorders. Now, as these speakers spoke, I started to feel this big ball of mushy feelings start to develop in the back of my throat, which then started to make me cry. Now, in that moment, I think I was just so startled by the authenticity of the speakers, how eloquently they spoke from the heart. For once, I felt I wasn't crazy. Someone had had a similar experience to me. I was not to say that my treatment team weren't helpful. They were amazing. But for once, someone shared these same bizarre rules as me and understood that not following them made me feel as if I was about to be pushed off a cliff due to intense anxiety. For such a long time, I had inhabited and adopted this patient in treatment identity, struggling to find a more meaningful concept of self. And I think it was those speakers there on that night, daring to be and being vulnerable, that enabled that personal level of connection with me. Finally, I could relate to someone. Something within me believed I could get past that plateau point in recovery. Those people on stage, they were living, breathing evidence, the proof I needed to see that recovery wasn't impossible, that it was worth it in the end. Now, it was in that moment that I realised just how powerful the lived experience movement can be of sharing your mental health stories of success. Now, you might be wondering, what exactly is lived experience? Lived experience is the experience we have of our own and others, mental health issues, emotional distress and mental illnesses. Lived experience, to me, means a lot. And there are many forms of lived experience, such as this, lived experience speaking, peer mentoring and peer support. I've been a lived experience speaker now for about two and a half years and currently help train others in becoming lived experience speakers to share their stories of recovery, hope and inspiration in safe and purposeful ways. Lived experience speaking for me is a tool of self-reflection because every single story I tell is different. It reflects how I feel on that day, in that specific moment, where I am in recovery. It empowers and encourages me every single day to stay recovered. Our lived experience speaking gives me purpose. I learned to turn up the volume of things in my life that matter most to me, such as catching with friends over brunch, having smashed avocado, art journaling, and doing this. And today, I can proudly say that I am a fully functioning human being. And that is lived experience. Now, although I've personally found the lived experience movement to be very inspirational in my personal recovery, I do know that some others may not necessarily agree. One of my friends, Michaela, came up to me one day and she asked me, what would psychologists do They'd feel replaced. And I said to her, mental health lived experience advocates are not therapists. We are agents of change, supporters, there to supplement the work of mental health professionals. 
We may not hold these fancy PhDs and master's degrees, but we are the experts of our own minds and of our own experiences. No one else. Now, she nodded at me. Now, whether this was an agreement, I wasn't too sure. But she turned back to me and said, well, what about the risk of having a negative impact on that client? And I said to her, look, there is a possibility of risk in pretty much anything you do. But current models of peer support are backed up by solid evidence. Peer workers have undergone extensive training and do have adequate support structures in place if they do need them. Now, let's have a look at a study by Hyatt and colleagues in 2012 who examined the perceived helpfulness of treatments in depression. Now, this study found that 97% of respondents actually found support from family and friends to be more helpful compared to the 87% of psychological therapies and 81% of psychotherapies. This is just one example highlighting how disclosures to family and friends can often be the most important. Because sometimes opening up to a health professional for that first time can be so incredibly intimidating. My friends love me less. Will I get fired from my job? My friends see me differently. These are the questions that plague us. Now, late last year, I was invited to speak at a lived experience event. And, as, and right after I spoke, this guy, he came up to me and he said, how did you do it? Recovery sucks and it's crappy every single day. And I said to him, you're right. Recovery does suck. It's crappy every single day. But be patient. Trust in yourself. Recovery is not something that happens overnight, but can take months and years. But it is so incredibly worth it in the end. I said to him, challenging those negative thoughts can be difficult. Because when you do, that eating disorder voice ramps up. And in response to that, your recovery voice ramps up. And what you get is this escalating arms race in your mind that makes it so incredibly overwhelming to think about anything else but that. But write it out. Trust in yourself. Trust in the process of recovery, in your treatment team. Trust that the hard work you put in now will turn into fruition later on. Now, I gave him my email to stay in touch, and it wasn't until a couple of months ago that this email notification popped up on my screen. It was from the same guy I had met at this event. And in his email, he said to me, thank you. Thank you for inspiring me, for giving me hope that recovery wasn't impossible, that I could do it. And I said to him, you had it in you all along. You had all the skills you'd learned from therapy. All you needed to do was to trust and believe in yourself that recovery was possible to hope. Now to think that such a small amount of my time had the ability to plant the idea in someone else's mind that recovery wasn't impossible. That feeling was incredible. And this is why I keep doing what I do. This is the power of lived experience of sharing your mental health stories of success. Now, for the client, you can help those disengaged re-engage in treatment. You can help enhance service delivery and quality, reduce waitlist times, lengths of hospitalizations, reduce costs, which can then be re-injected into our healthcare system. And for everyone sitting here today, Sharing your mental health stories of success can inspire others. Because remember, that person sitting four seats down from you may be experiencing a mental illness. By engaging in the lived experience movement, we're helping health professionals see peer workers, not as patients, 
but as functional human beings with a purpose. By engaging in the lived experience movement, we are challenging the dominant paradigm. We are empowering those in the patient role to be part of the bigger movement towards greater equity, rights and justice. We are bypassing that power imbalance. Now, a lot of you here may be sitting here today thinking, well, what can I do? And at a very basic level, we can start by being comfortable, having those are you okay conversations with others, learning to recognise when one of our mates aren't themselves. And together, we can help make the mental health lived experience movement a more dominant part of our healthcare system. And remember, we are the experts of our own minds and of our own experiences. No one else. So don't be afraid to let your guard down. Be vulnerable. Share your stories of hope and inspiration and recovery with others. Because by doing so, you heal and others do too. Thank you.